The distribution of sample means is the collection of all sample means for all possible random samples of a particular size. Although the distribution of sample means is a theoretical distribution, we can make it fairly concrete when we do these little simulation experiments. Remember, we're never forming a distribution of sample means in order to do real statistical inference. Rather, we're doing it now to learn about how we make statistical inferences. But the distribution of sample means is really a real thing, even though it's theoretical. It is the collection of every possible sample that we could form of a particular size from a population. Now, the distribution of sample means is really only one of a class of distributions called sampling distributions. A sampling distribution is a distribution of statistics, it could be a mean, it could be a variance, obtained from computing a statistic for every possible random sample of size n from a population. I actually showed you a sampling distribution before we even got to this topic when we were looking at the bias of estimating the population variance. We actually formed a sampling distribution of the variance estimator s squared, and we looked at that sampling distribution to investigate the bias of the statistic. The way we did that was looking at what the mean was of the sampling distribution of s squared. For this module, we'll be looking at the distribution of x bar, that is, the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Now I said we can actually form a real sampling distribution, and I want to show you how we can do that. Let's construct the real sampling distribution for a small population. Now to do this, we're going to follow four steps. We're going to choose a population first. It's going to have to be a fairly small population, you'll see, because these sampling distributions get very large with even modestly sized populations. The second step is we'll enumerate every possible sample of size n. And here could be two individuals, it could be 20 individuals. We have to choose our sample size before we make the sampling distribution. Next, we'll calculate the mean for each sample of size n, and then for convenience, we'll plot a histogram of the means we calculate. In the journal that accompanies this module, go under the Building a Sampling Distribution section under With a Small Population. This data set has all the possible sample means we could obtain from a population with only 10 values when we're taking two observations each. Notice what I mean. The population only has the values 1 through 10, and they're equally represented. What we have in this data set is every possible combination when we're taking two observations of the values of 1 and 10. So notice we have 1, 1, 2, 1, all the way up to 10, 1, and if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, we see we end up with 110 all the way through 1010. These are all the possible samples of size 2 that we can get from a population that has those values. So this distribution of sample means has 100 different sample means. And actually, if we go to the top and I right click on the mean column, you can see how I'm computing this. I'm using the mean function and taking the mean of observation 1 and observation 2. So, this is a true sampling distribution. These are all the possible means we could obtain from that population when we're taking samples of size 2. Now let's take a look at our distribution of sample means. I'll go to the Analyze menu, select Distribution, and cast Mean into the Y role. Now this distribution may look familiar. It has that similar triangular shape that we saw when we took samples of size 2 for a binomial process. This distribution is also symmetric, and it has a mean of 5.5. Now 5.5 is actually the mean of our observations themselves. If I go back and grab one of the observation columns, click it into Y, you'll notice the mean of our observations, really the mean of the population, because these are all the population values, is also 5.5. Now you may notice one more thing. The standard deviation of our observations is 2.88. The standard deviation of this sampling distribution of sample means, when we have samples of size 2, is smaller. Now this should tell you something. Remember that area of a distribution reflects the probability of making a random selection. The standard deviation being smaller means that this distribution is more concentrated in the center, that is, there's not as much in the extremes. So, if we consider what the probability is of drawing a random observation that has a value of 1, I'll just select that here, 
This is our observation of one, and if we go back to the table, it's 10 out of the 100. Well, we can think of this even more simply. The chance of getting an observation of one if there are 10 values is just one tenth. Now, what's the probability of getting a mean of one? Getting a mean of one should be harder. There's actually only one way we can get a mean of one. That's getting an observation one that has a value of one and an observation two that has a value of one. To do this, let me actually go to the tools menu. I'll get the grabber tool and let me drag this to the right to make the bins even smaller. So now that we can see all the different samples, let me go ahead and select the times when we got a mean of one. Notice if I go to the table, that only happened one in a hundred times. Remember, when we have independent events and drawing an observation from a distribution are two independent events, the way we operate on those to figure out the probability is the probability of the first event times the probability of the second. So, in order to get that observation, this mean of one, we actually had to get an unlikely event the first time, a value of one, multiplied by the same unlikely event, a value of one. So this happened only 0.1 times 0.1, or now 0.01 proportion of the time. So the insight here is, as soon as we start taking means of observations, that is, we have sample sizes of two or more, it starts to get harder and harder to get the extreme values. And again, that should make sense. It's simply an unlikely occurrence that we're gonna get a sample with observation one that is one, and observation two that is one. Now another way to see this is let me go to the Analyze menu and select Fit Y by X. And let's actually put observation one and observation two as our Y and our X. Now what we're gonna look at here is actually the grid of our observations. That is what we got for observation one on the Y axis and what we got for observation two on the X axis. So these are 100 little dots. If I select that observation, that is the mean of one, Notice it's just one out of these hundred dots. You can think of all the samples we got, and in fact they are, on this grid. These are all the sample means we obtained. We're not displaying the means in this grid, we're simply looking at the different points. But if I select any of these, you can see it selects the means in the table. So, if you think about randomly selecting a dot from this grid, it would be unlikely, actually one in a hundred, to get one that yielded an extreme sample mean. Think about the probability of getting a 10 as the mean. That can only happen one way. That is, sampling a 10 on the first observation and a 10 on the second. Now what about the means that are close to the center? These are the ones that happen pretty frequently. Let me select those means. I'll select them in here. And notice that this is the center diagonal. This is actually a pretty large space in this grid. To get one of the high probability means is fairly likely. That's why they're high probability. There's a lot of different ways we can get a mean of six, seven, four, three. These are pretty likely because there's just multiple combinations. So in thinking forward about how we would use a distribution of sample means like this to make an inference, imagine there's something in the world that has that real population, values from one to 10 equally likely. Suppose we take two observations and take a mean, but we've actually treated those observations in some special way. Suppose we end up with a mean of one. Now, we know something about the likelihood of getting a mean of one if we were simply taking a random sample of size two. But we've treated our sample in some special way, and we've gotten a sample mean that is very unlikely to happen when we're simply taking samples. So, this might give us some reason to reject that first explanation to say that it's not simply sampling error that caused us to get a mean that was so extreme, or in other words, a mean that was very unlikely to get if we're simply taking random samples.